will go straight to the point with a simple message, a message that has become uh, dearer to my heart. It was a message I presented at um, the birthday celebration of a very influential African leader. And the audience consisted of, you know, uh, Supreme Court justices, you know, uh, political leaders, ambassadors, etc., etc. This person was 70 years old, and she also happens to be a Christian, and uh, she has served in many cabinet positions. Uh, I don't want to uh, reveal who she is, but you know, on that occasion, she wanted. Me, we don't belong to the same faith, but she said, Dr. Pepem, I want you to come and speak to the hearts of all these leaders. And so, taking advantage of the fact that she was 70 years old, and all that comes with it, I presented a simple message titled, Uncomfortable Grace. Uncomfortable Grace. God's leadings through our trials and sorrow. Uncomfortable grace. Let me begin by summarizing what uncomfortable grace is. I got that phrase from a book I was reading by an author. The author is Paul David Tripp. And Paul David Tripp said this. He said, there are moments in our lives when we are crying out for grace, not recognizing we are getting it. Let me just pause. Sometimes you'll be praying for God to help you out in this, not knowing you are already receiving that grace. He goes on to say, we are not getting the grace of relief or the grace of release because that is not the grace that we really need. Sometimes you are praying, Lord, I need relief in this area. I need release in this area. You are praying for this grace, but you don't receive it because that is not what you really need. Then he added, no, what we are getting is something we desperately need, and he calls it the uncomfortable grace of personal growth and change. What God, looking at us, realizes we need the most is his uncomfortable grace. Because that uncomfortable grace enables us to experience personal growth and change. I was struck by that paragraph, but especially that phrase, uncomfortable grace. And that is why I title this message, Uncomfortable Grace. God's leadings through our trials and our sorrows. Here is a summary of what I'm coming to say. I have taken his phrase, uncomfortable grace, and now I have crafted a message around it, the summary of which is what I put on the screen. Uncomfortable grace takes us through places we never intended to go so that we will arrive where God wants us to be. Let me say it again. Uncomfortable grace takes us through places we never intended to go so that we will arrive where God wants us to be. It is a thorn in the flesh grace that develops and refines our character. That's the summary of the message. Each one of us seated here this afternoon is experiencing God's uncomfortable grace. See, we are accustomed to talking about God's amazing grace. Marvelous grace, we sang about it. But do we know of God's uncomfortable grace? which takes us through places we never intended to go through. But when God is finished, we shall arrive where he has destined us to be. Amen. The story of Joseph 
It's a story of God's uncomfortable grace. He never intended to go inside that pit. He never intended to go to Egypt. It's definitely not under those circumstances. He never intended to go to prison. Yet when God was finished, Joseph was where God wanted him to be. But you see, in the case of Joseph, he didn't cause this. It was the hatred, the envy of his brothers. But too often, we bring our problems upon ourselves. But here is the good news. Even in those instances, God's uncomfortable grace will allow us to go through places we never intended to go. And when God is finished, we shall be where he wants us to be. Amen? That's the whole sermon. And I'm going to focus on the life of Jacob. And you are going to see God's uncomfortable grace at work. And I'm sure in the experience of Jacob, you would experience your own as well. The key Bible text that we ought to keep in mind is a familiar one, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, how many things? All. all. Not some things, all things. Not most things, all things. They work together for good to them that love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. Another text upon which this whole concept of God's uncomfortable grace is based is 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. This is Apostle Paul speaking, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Let me just pause. Paul says, see, the Lord had blessed Paul abundantly. And he says, in order not to be exalted, in order not to be proud, a thorn in the flesh was given me. Literally means a gift was given me, and this gift was thorn in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh was given me. A messenger of Satan to Buffett. I mean, God actually allows Satan to Buffett to terrorize you. But notice, it is a gift. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would depart from me. It's not just I prayed only three times. It's an idiomatic expression. I prayed and prayed and prayed that Lord take this away. It can be illness. It can be joblessness. It can be family problems, children's problems, parents' problems, school problems, whatever it is. You have been praying and praying and praying that God will take it away. And yet God doesn't seem to take it away. Remember, uncomfortable grace. You pray for something, you are not receiving it. You are not receiving it because that is not what you need. But God allows you to experience what you need in order for you to grow and change. Paul says, this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan that was tormenting him, he prayed three times. I prayed and prayed that it should depart from me. And what was God's response? And he said to me, what? My grace. Notice how he calls it. My grace. You mean the thorn in the flesh was grace? Yes. You mean the messenger of Satan was grace? Yes. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And when Paul realizes this, this is the uncomfortable grace. He said, therefore, most gladly will I rather boast in my infirmities 
that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And now he gives us a catalog of those uncomfortable experiences. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Is any one of us experiencing some infirmities, some reproaches? Is any one of us experiencing need, persecution, distress, hardships? It's uncomfortable grace. Uncomfortable grace. It takes us through places we never intended so that we will arrive where God wants us to be. This is the substance of the message, uncomfortable grace. To illustrate this point, which I have summarized, and also giving you the key Bible texts, we are going to look at one Bible character. His life experience echoes that of many of us. And yet, how God used it to bring him where he needed to be. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts again this afternoon, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Life is full of sorrow. It is full of trouble. It was King David who said, Psalm 90 verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet the abuse is only labor and sorrow. Remember, this message was presented on the occasion of someone's 70th birthday. He said, life maximum 70 years. If you exceed these 70 years, the remainder is full of labor and sorrow. But you see, you don't have to be 70 years to experience troubles. Solomon said, the days of man, not just after 70 years, the days of man are full of what? Grief and pain. If you read Ecclesiastes 2, 23, all his days, human beings days, are sorrowful. They are full of sorrow. His work burdensome. Even in the night, his heart takes no rest. You just can't sleep. There's a songwriter called John Moore, he wrote a song, Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. If there is one Bible character who has faced these experiences, I think it is the story of Jacob. We know Jacob. The Bible identifies him as a character through whom the people of Israel came. So he's, when he was not converted, he was Jacob. When God changed his name, he became Israel. His descendants became the Israelites, Jacob. Because of one sin he committed in his life, the remainder of his life was full of sorrow and trouble. On one occasion, when he went to Egypt, and uh, that time, Joseph had become Pharaoh, had worked things out for Jacob and his family to arrive in Egypt. And so Joseph ushered his father into the presence of the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh asked Jacob. You read this in Genesis 47, verses uh, uh, 8 and 9. I made a mistake. Verses 8 and 9. Pharaoh asked him, Jacob, how old are you? Just picture the scene. Here is King Pharaoh meeting Jacob for the first time. Welcome, old man. Welcome to Egypt. How old are you? And Jacob responded to Pharaoh, the years of my pilgrimage are 130. I am 130 years old. But my years have been few and difficult. 
Pharaoh didn't ask him for that. He simply asked, how old are you? I'm 130 years, but my years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. My fathers, Abraham, Isaac, they lived longer than me. This 130 years, few though they are, difficult. I don't know about you, but if you have lived a little longer on this earth, you would notice life is difficult. It is difficult. Chances are many of us came into this country as immigrants, whether voluntarily or against your will. And life, difficult. My years have been few and difficult. See, all through the life of Jacob, especially after he departed from God, most of the pain was self-inflicted, the result of departing from God. The message is titled, Uncomfortable Grace. God's grace taking us through places we never intended, so we shall be where he wants us to be. The life of Jacob depicts it. Let me summarize for you the life of Jacob. You know how he stole his brother's birthright. He and the mother orchestrated it. Ellen White says this in the book Petras and Prophets, page 237 to 238. Here's a summary of Jacob's life. Jacob had sinned and had deeply suffered. Many years of toil. I think you can identify this. Many years of toil and care and sorrow had been his since the day when his great sin caused him to flee from his father's time. He was a homeless fugitive. He was not just a homeless. He was also a fugitive, runaway, wanted. Homeless fugitive, separated from his mother. This was the woman he was very close to, but on account of his sin, separated from his mother, whom he never saw again. Laboring seven years for her whom he loved, only to be basely cheated. If you've experienced the broken heart experiences of love, you can identify with Jacob. Toiling 20 years in the service of a covetous and grasping kinsman. If you have labored in this country, under covetous businessmen, you would identify. Seeing his wealth increasing and his sons rising around him, but finding little joy in the contentious and divided household. After you've toiled and labored, especially in this country, somehow you finally arrive, you think. And yet suddenly your home, confusion. Jacob. Distressed by his daughter's shame, by her brother's revenge, by the death of Rachel, by the unnatural crime of Reuben, by Judas, I mean, Ellen White is cuddling Jacob, said, by the cruel deception and malice practiced towards Joseph. I mean, now Jacob, for all his life, he lived under the torment that his beloved son Joseph was dead. How long and dark is the catalog of evil spread out to view? Again and again, he had reaped the fruit of that first wrong deed. Over and over, he saw repeated among his sons the sins of which he himself had been guilty. But, and here's the point, bitter as had been the discipline, it had accomplished its work. Amen? The chastening, though grievous, had yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. What Ellen White is saying is, despite all the pain, when God was finished with Jacob, Jacob was where God wanted him to be. Amen. But keep in mind Jacob's own statement, my years have been few and difficult. And it is all because of his own action in departing from God. 
You see, this message I'm sharing with you, I'm not sharing it with people who are so innocent, so holy, that, you know, their family members, friends, colleagues have done bad things to them. Joseph. You can understand uncomfortable grace if you are a Joseph. God taking you through places you never intended to be, and then you arrive where he wants you to be. But if the experiences of pain is the consequence of some of your bad choices and decisions, yes. it hurts even more. Yes. But the good news is, even in those cases, God's uncomfortable grace still works. Amen. It works not just for Joseph's, but for Jacob's. But Jacob's life, full of difficulty and pain, years before he went to Egypt, you can tell this was Joseph's own, uh, Jacob's own experience. On another occasion, he mentioned again his pain. This was when uh, his children had gone to Egypt. And you know the story how Joseph discovered they were his brothers. But he didn't reveal himself. He tried to test them. And then, I won't bore you, you can read it in Genesis you know, 41, 42, etc. He, he said, you are spies. They said, no, we are not spies. We are all children of the same father. We are ten of us. One of us, one of them is not, the other is, you know, uh, back home. And jo jo Joseph did the calculation. He said, no, you are spies. Long story short. He said, then go and bring that brother who is back home before I release you. No, he arrested Simeon. I'll put him in jail. And then you go and bring your other brother, referring to Benjamin. And they knew that to be hard on the father. So they went back home without Simeon. Simeon was detained. When they arrived home, they told their father, Daddy, we went to Egypt. And the Pharaoh we met, the second in command, he gave us a lot of trouble. He has arrested our brother uh, Simeon, and he wants us to bring Benjamin. The father almost died. Here is Jacob speaking. Genesis 42, 36, and Jacob said to his children, you have bereaved me, you've killed me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. If you listen closely to Jacob, you are going to hear his pain. You've bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. You want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Now, put these words on your lips. And change the words Joseph, Simeon, Benjamin to anything you can think of. Sometimes we look at our lives and we wonder about the things that have happened. There have been times when it seems like our Josephs are no more. The people we hold so dear are no more. Simeons are no more. And then the very ones we are holding on to Benjamins, they want to take away. And then you look back and you say, everything is against me. Have you been to that experience before? When, like Jacob, you cried, Joseph is no more. My marriage is no more. My job is no more. My Simeon is no more. My health is no more. And the little I have, you are taken away. Everything is against me. But here's the question. Is it really true? that Joseph is no more? No. But Jacob, with his limited sight, he thought Joseph was no more. 
As far as he was concerned, Joseph was dead. Is it really true that Simeon is no more? No. As a matter of fact, Simeon was in Egypt. He was not in custody. He was actually, today you say, under house arrest. But it wasn't really house arrest. Joseph actually provided him some nice place. So, it is not true that Joseph is no more. It is not true that Simeon is no more. And when he says, everything is against me, is it really true? No. On the contrary, everything was working together for his good and to God's glory. Because the Joseph he feared was no more, God actually had orchestrated Joseph to be in a position of power so that he will save God's people. Simeon, whom he thought was no more, has been kept over there, and because of him, it would enable jo Jacob and his whole household to go to Egypt. And when he said, everything is against me, brothers and sisters, no. Everything was conspiring together so that Jacob, his descendants, will be in Egypt. They will grow into a nation. God would deliver them and the Messiah would come through them. Yes. That's the whole message. Uncomfortable grace. Takes us through places we never intended to go. So that when God is done, we shall be where he wants us to be. Have you gone through some experiences lately when you think, my health is no more, my job is no more, my family is no more, everything is against me, and you cry and cry out to the Lord, he doesn't seem to hear or care. It is part of God's uncomfortable grace. It is the thorn in the flesh grace, which is given as it is a gift designed to bring the best out of you, designed to help you grow. So that what in your limited sight you thought was against you was actually working for your good. Amen. That is why Paul can say, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. We know all things. Look, son of God, daughter of God, take heart. Take heart in whatever you are going through right now. Because one of these days, soon, you will step back and say, Lord, you are so amazing. Amen. This thing yes. that I thought was against me was actually working for my good. Uncomfortable grace. Do, do you understand? You know, Ellen White says, or perhaps if I read Ellen White's statement, when it seems like our Josephs are no more and our Simeons are no more and everything is against us, in actuality, they are all working for our good and they are part of God's uncomfortable grace. Let us repeat this concept together again. Uncomfortable grace takes us through places we never intended, so we will arrive where we are destined to be. Let's just pause there. That's all I want you to take from this message. Uncomfortable grace. It takes us through places we never intended. Some of you never intended to be here in Houston, Texas. Some of you never intended to be in the job that you are in. 
And I even dare say in certain marriages that you are in now. Uncomfortable grace. It's operative in Joseph's. It is also operative in Jacob's. It takes us through places we never intended. So we will arrive where God has destined us to be. It is a thorn in the flesh grace and it develops character and refines. Here is what Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 528. To all who are reaching out to feel the guiding hand of God, the moment of greatest discouragement is the time when divine help is nearest. The moment of greatest discouragement. When you think everything is against me. That is the time when divine help is nearest. And Ellen White continues by saying, We, they will look back with thankfulness upon the darkest part of the way. One day soon, we shall all look back and thank the Lord for the darkest parts of our life experiences. Cancer, diabetes, have you been fired from your job? Broken heart, divorce, what is it? Your most discouraging experience, the darkest part of your way, one day you will look back upon it and thank the Lord. Amen. Uncomfortable grace. See, when God decides to work out his will, it is simply amazing. You know, when we sing the song, amazing grace, marvelous grace, calculate within it also his uncomfortable grace. Because the darkest parts of our experience, the moments when we felt very discouraged, divine health is nearest. She continued, so today we may not always understand the reasons for our tragedies, our disappointments and pains. We may not always be able to articulate why we have to go through trials, temptations, and afflictions, but we know that one day all would be made plain. This is what happened in the case of Jacob. Towards the end of his life, he came to understand that what he thought was against him was actually working for his good. In fact, he came to realize God was closest to him during those dark moments. When you go to Genesis 48, verses 15 and 16, the final act of Jacob before he died, he called his uh, sons and he started blessing them. And now, listen to the blessing he uh, placed on Ephraim and Manasseh. He says, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, may the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. Just pause there. He said God has been his shepherd how long? All my life. Just two weeks ago he was saying everything is against me. <laughs> Joseph was no more. Simeon no more. You want to, everything is against me. Now towards the end of his life he said may the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. May the angel who has delivered me from all harm, mm, yes. may he bless the voice. Jacob, before his death, looked back on his life experiences and concluded with Ellen White that the moment of greatest discouragement was when divine help was nearest. Amen. He looked back on the darkest period of his life and he praised the Lord. May the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. May the angel, referring to Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord, who has delivered me from all harm, Bless you. One more statement from Ellen White, 
and then I open it up for your reflection. Ellen White says in Testimonies, Volume 1, page 286 to 288, one day, referring to what will happen when Jesus comes and we are taken home, one day all that has perplexed us in the providences of God will in the world to come be made plain. One day they will be made plain. The things that are hard to be understood will then find explanation. The mysteries of what? Grace. Notice he calls them grace. The mysteries of grace will unfold before us. One day you would understand his uncomfortable grace. The mysteries of grace will unfold before us. Where our finite minds discovered only confusion and broken promises, we shall see the most perfect and beautiful harmony. Amen? Amen. We shall know that infinite love ordered the experiences that seemed most trying to us. As we realize the tender care of him who makes all things work together for good or our good, we shall rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen? Amen. One day things will become plain. And like Jacob, you also will declare that God, has been my shepherd all my life. The angel of the Lord has delivered me through all harm. Uncomfortable grace. Is God leading through our trials and sorrow? Never forget it. Uncomfortable grace takes us through places we never intended so that we will arrive where we are destined to be. May the Lord richly bless us. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads, please. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the blessing that you have brought to us through Elder Pipim this afternoon. We pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to learn from what we have studied and realize, Lord, that when we sometimes go through trials and tribulation, God's eyes are never closed upon us. But at the end, we will see that all things came uh, from above for our good and for our well-being. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us and help us to be more diligent in the studying of your word so that we'll be able to see those things that we need to see, especially in times like these. So help us to have our eyes focus upon Jesus so that as Jacob, when they come upon us, we will still say, well, we have been going through all this stuff all these years, but at the end, he'll say, the Lord has been my shepherd throughout. So, Lord, we ask that you would continue to be our good shepherd and help us to keep our eyes focused upon you and help us to prepare ourselves for your soon coming so that each one of us will be in your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.